A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens Part 1. Jacob Marley Marley was dead to begin with. There is no doubt whatever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it, and Scrooge's name was good upon change for anything he chose to put his hand to. Old Marley was as dead as a doornail. Scrooge knew he was dead, of course he did, how could it be otherwise? Scrooge and he were partners for I don't know how many years. Scrooge was his sole executor, his sole administrator, his sole friend, and sole mourner. So there is no doubt that Marley was dead. This must be distinctly understood, or nothing wonderful can come of the story I am going to relate. Scrooge never painted out old Marley's name. There it stood years afterwards above the warehouse door. Scrooge and Marley. The firm was known as Scrooge and Marley. Sometimes people new to the business called Scrooge Scrooge, and sometimes Marley, but he answered to both names. It was all the same to him. Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone, Scrooge. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. Hard and sharp as flint, from which no steel had ever struck out generous fire. Secret and self-contained and solitary as an oyster. Even the blind men's dogs appeared to know him, and when they saw him coming on would tug their owners into doorways. But what did Scrooge care? It was the very thing he liked. Once upon a time, of all the good days in the year on Christmas Eve, old Scrooge sat busy in his counting-house. It was cold, bleak, biting weather. The city clocks had only just gone three, but it was quite dark already. It had not been night all day. And candles were flaring in the windows of the neighbouring offices like ruddy smears upon the palpable brown air. The fog came pouring in at every chink and keyhole, and was so dense without that although the court was of the narrowest, the houses opposite were mere phantoms. The door of Scrooge's counting-house was open, that he might keep his eye upon his clerk, who, in a dismal little cell beyond, was copying letters. Scrooge had a very small fire, but the clerk's fire was so much very smaller that it looked like one coal. Wherefore, the clerk put on his white comforter, and tried to warm himself at the candle, in which effort, being not a man of a strong imagination, he failed. "'A merry Christmas, Uncle! God save you!' cried a cheerful voice. It was the voice of Scrooge's nephew, who came upon him so quickly that this was the first intimation he had of his approach. "'Bah!' said Scrooge. "'Humbug!' "'Christmas a humbug, Uncle!' said Scrooge's nephew. "'You don't mean that, I'm sure!' "'I do!' said Scrooge. Merry Christmas! What right have you to be merry? What reason have you to be merry? You're poor enough. Come, then, returned the nephew gaily. What right have you to be dismal? What reason have you to be morose? You're rich enough. Scrooge, having no better answer ready on the spur of the moment, said, Bah! again, and followed it up with, Humbug! Oh, don't be cross, uncle, said the nephew. What else can I be, returned the uncle, when I live in such a world of fools as this? Merry Christmas! Out upon Merry Christmas. What's Christmas time to you but a time for paying bills without money? A time for finding yourself a year older, but not an hour richer? If I could work my will, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. Uncle, pleaded the nephew. Nephew, returned the uncle sternly. Keep your Christmas in your own way and let me keep it in mine. Keep it, repeated Scrooge's nephew, but you don't keep it. Well, let me leave it alone, then, said Scrooge. Much good may it do you, much good it has ever done you. Well, there are many things for which I might have derived good, by which I have not profited, I dare say, returned the nephew. Christmas among the rest. But I am sure I have always thought of Christmas time as a good time. A kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time. The only time I know of in the long calendar of the year when men and women seem by one consent to open their shut-up hearts freely. And therefore, uncle, though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe it has done me good and will do me good. And I say, God bless it. The clerk in the tank involuntarily applauded. 
Let me hear another sound from you, Bob Cratchit, said Scrooge, and you'll keep your Christmas by losing your situation. You're quite a powerful speaker, sir, he added, turning to his nephew. I wonder you don't go into Parliament. Oh, don't be angry, Uncle. Calm, dine with us tomorrow. Scrooge said that he would see him... Well, yes, indeed he did. He went the whole length of the expression and said that he would see him in that extremity first. But why? cried Scrooge's nephew. Why? Why did you get married? said Scrooge. Because I fell in love. <laughs> because you fell in love? Good afternoon. Nay, uncle, but you never came to see me before that happened. Why give it as a reason for not coming now? Good afternoon. I want nothing from you. I ask nothing of you. Why cannot we be friends? Good afternoon. I'm sorry with all my heart to find you so resolute. We've never had any quarrel to which I have been a party. But I have made the trial in homage to Christmas, and I'll keep my Christmas humour to the last. So a Merry Christmas, Uncle. Good afternoon. And a Happy New Year. Good afternoon! His nephew left the room without an angry word notwithstanding. He stopped at the outer door to bestow the greeting of the season on the clerk, who, cold as he was, was warmer than Scrooge, for he returned them cordially. <laughs> There's another fellow muttered Scrooge, who overheard him. My clerk, with fifteen shillings a week and a wife and family talking about a Merry Christmas. <laughs> I'll retire to Bedlam. The clerk, in letting Scrooge's nephew out, had let two other people in. They were portly gentlemen, pleasant to behold, and now stood with their hats off in Scrooge's office. They had books and papers in their hands and bowed to him. Scrooge and Marley's, I believe, said one of the gentlemen, referring to his list. Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? "'Mr. Marley has been dead these seven years,' Scrooge replied. "'He died seven years ago this very night.' Well, "'We have no doubt his liberality is well represented by his surviving partner,' said the gentleman, presenting his credentials. It certainly was, for they had been two kindred spirits. At the ominous word, liberality, Scrooge frowned and shook his head and handed the credentials back. "'At this um, festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge,' said the gentleman, taking up a pen, "'it is more than usually desirable that we should make some slight provision for the poor and destitute, "'who suffer greatly at the present time. "'Many thousands are in want of common necessaries. "'Hundreds of thousands are in want of common comforts, sir.' "'Are there no prisons?' asked Scrooge. Well, "'Plenty of prisons,' said the gentleman, laying the pen down again. "'And the Union workhouses, are they still in operation?' Well, "'They are. Still... I wish I could say they were not. Oh, oh, I was afraid from what you said at first that something had occurred to stop them in their useful course. I'm very glad to hear it. Well, under the impression that they scarcely furnish Christian cheer of mind or body to the multitude, returned the gentleman, a few of us are endeavouring to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. We chose this time because it is a time of all others when want is keenly felt and abundance rejoices. "'What shall I put you down for?' "'Nothing,' Scrooge replied. "'You wish to remain anonymous?' "'I wish to be left alone,' said Scrooge. "'Since you ask me what I wish, gentlemen, that is my answer. "'I don't make myself merry at Christmas, "'and I can't afford to make idle people merry. "'I help to support the establishments I have mentioned. "'They cost enough, and those who are badly off must go there.' Well, many can't go there, and many would rather die. If they would rather die, said Scrooge, they had better do it and decrease the surplus population. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Seeing that it would be useless to pursue their point, the gentlemen withdrew. The cold became intense, piercing, searching, biting cold. The owner of one scant young nose, gnawed and mumbled by the hungry cold as bones are gnawed by dogs, stooped down at Scrooge's keyhole to regale him with a Christmas carol, but at the first sound of God rest you merry gentlemen, may nothing you dismay, Scrooge seized the ruler with such energy of action that the singer fled in terror, leaving the keyhole to the fog and even more congenial frost. At length the hour of shutting up the counting-house arrived. With an ill will, Scrooge dismounted from his stool and tacitly admitted the fact to the expectant clerk in the tank, who instantly snuffed his candle out and put on his hat. "'Me all want all day tomorrow, I suppose,' said Scrooge. "'Um, if quite convenient, sir.' "'It's not convenient, it's not fair. "'If I was to stop half a crown for it, you'd think yourself ill-used, I'll be bound.' The clerk smiled, faintly. "'And yet you don't think me ill-used when I pay a day's wages for no work.' The clerk observed that it was only once a year.' "'That's a poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December,' 
said Scrooge, buttoning his great coat to the chin. But I suppose you must have the whole day. Be here all the earlier the next morning. The clerk promised that he would, and Scrooge walked out with a growl. The office was closed in a twinkling, and the clerk, with the long ends of his white comforter dangling below his waist, went down a slide on Corn Hill at the end of a lane of boys twenty times in honour of its being Christmas Eve, and then ran home to Camden Town as hard as he could pelt to play at Blind Man's Buff. Scrooge took his melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern, and having read all the newspapers and beguiled the rest of the evening with his banker's book, went home to bed. He lived in chambers which had once belonged to his deceased partner. They were a gloomy suite of rooms in a lowering pile of building up a yard, where it had so little business to be that one could scarcely help fancying it must have run there when it was a young house playing at hide-and-seek with other houses and forgotten the way out again. It was old enough now and dreary enough, for nobody lived in it but Scrooge, the other rooms all being let out as offices. Now, it is a fact that there was nothing at all particular about the knocker on the door, except that it was very large. It is also a fact that Scrooge had seen it night and morning during his whole residence in that place, also that Scrooge had as little of what is called fancy about him as any man in the city of London. And yet Scrooge, having his key in the lock of the door, saw in the knocker, without its undergoing any intermediate process of change, not a knocker, but Marley's face. <laughs> Marley's face, with a dismal light about it, like a bad lobster in a dark cellar. It was not angry or ferocious, but looked at Scrooge as Marley used to look, with ghostly spectacles turned up upon its ghostly forehead. The hair was curiously stirred, as if by breath or hot air, and though the eyes were wide open, they were perfectly motionless. As Scrooge looked fixedly at this phenomenon, it was a knocker again. He said, Poo! Poo! And closed the door with a bang! The sound resounded through the house like thunder. Every room above and every cask in the wine merchant's cellars below appeared to have a separate peal of echoes of its own. Scrooge was not a man to be frightened by echoes. He fastened the door and walked across the hall and up the stairs, slowly, too, trimming his candle as he went. Darkness is cheap and Scrooge liked it. But before he shut his heavy door, he walked through his rooms to see that all was right. He had just enough recollection of the face to desire to do that. Sitting room, bedroom, lumber room, all were as they should be. Nobody under the table, nobody under the sofa, nobody under the bed, nobody in the closet, nobody in his dressing gown, which was hanging up in a suspicious attitude against the wall. Quite satisfied, he closed his door and locked himself in. Double locked himself in, which was not his custom. Thus secured against the surprise, he took off his cravat, put on his dressing gown and slippers and his nightcap, and sat down before the fire to take his gruel. As he sat in the chair, his glance happened to rest upon a bell, a disused bell that hung in the room, and communicated for some purpose now long forgotten with a chamber in the highest story of the building. It was with great astonishment, and with a strange, inexplicable dread, that as he looked, he saw this bell begin to swing. It swung so softly in the outset that it scarcely made a sound, but soon it rang out loudly, and so did every bell in the house. This might have lasted half a minute, or a minute, but it seemed an hour. Humbug! said Scrooge. The bells ceased as they had begun, together. They were succeeded by a clanking noise deep down below, as if some person were dragging a heavy chain over the casks in the wine merchant's cellar. The cellar door flew open with a booming sound, and then he heard the noise much louder on the floors below, then coming up the stairs, and then coming straight towards his door. It's humbug still, said Scrooge. I won't believe it. His colour changed, though, when, without a pause, it came on through the heavy door and passed into the room before his eyes. Upon its coming in, the dying flame leapt up as though it cried, I know him, Marley's ghost, and fell again. The same face, the very same. Marley in his pigtail, usual waistcoat, tights and boots, the tassels on the latter bristling like his pigtail, and his coat skirts, and the hair upon his head. 
The chain he drew was clasped about his middle. It was long and wound about him like a tail, and it was made, for Scrooge observed it closely, of cash boxes, keys, padlocks, ledgers, deeds, and heavy purses wrought in steel. How now? said Scrooge, caustic and cold as ever. What do you want with me? Much. Marley's voice, no doubt about it. Who are you? Ask me who I was. Well, who were you then? You're very particular for a ghost. In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. Can you... Can you sit down? asked Scrooge, looking doubtfully at him. I can. Well, do it then. You don't believe in me observed the ghost. I don't, said Scrooge. What evidence would you have of my reality beyond that of your senses? I don't know. Why do you doubt your senses? Because a little thing affects them. A slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheats. You might be an undigested bit of beef, a blot of mustard, a crumb of cheese, a fragment of an underdone potato. There's more of gravy than of grave about you, whatever you are. At this, the spirit raised a frightful cry and shook his chain with such a dismal and appalling noise that Scrooge fell upon his knees and clasped his hands before his face. Mercy, he said. Dreadful apparition, why do you trouble me? Man of the worldly mind, replied the ghost. Do you believe in me or not? I do, said Scrooge. I must, but, but why do spirits walk the earth and why do they come to me? It is required of every man, the ghost returned, that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men and travel far and wide. And if that spirit goes not forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. It is doomed to wander through the world and witness what it cannot share, but might have shared on earth, and turn to happiness! Oh! Again the spectre raised a cry and shook its chain and wrung its shadowy hands. You are fettered, said Scrooge, trembling. Tell me why. I wear the chain I forged in life, replied the ghost. I made it link by link and yard by yard. I girded it on of my own free will, and of my own free will I wore it. Would you know the weight and length of the strong coil you bear yourself? It was full as heavy and long as this seven Christmas eves ago. You have laboured on it since. It is a ponderous chain. Jacob, old Jacob Marley, tell me more. Speak comfort to me, Jacob. I have none to give, the ghost replied. It comes from other regions, Ebenezer Scrooge, and is conveyed by other ministers to other kinds of men. I cannot stay. I cannot linger anywhere. In life my spirit never roved beyond the narrow limits of our money-changing hole. But you were always a good man of business, Jacob. Business! cried the ghost, wringing its hands. Mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance and benevolence were all my business. At this time of the rolling year I suffer most. Why did I walk through crowds of my fellow beings with my eyes turned down and never raise them to that blessed star which led the wise men to a poor abode? Were there no poor homes to which its light would have conducted me? Scrooge was very much dismayed to hear the spectre going on at this rate and began to quake exceedingly. <gasps> hear me! cried the ghost. My time is nearly gone. I am here tonight to warn you that you have yet a chance and hope of escaping my fate, a chance and hope of my procuring Ebenezer. Oh, you were always a good friend to me, said Scrooge. Thank you. You will be haunted, resumed the ghost, by three spirits. Is that the chance and hope you mentioned, Jacob? It is. I, <laughs> I think I'd rather not. Without their visits, said the ghost, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Expect the first tomorrow, when the bell tolls one. Um, couldn't I take them all at once and have it over, Jacob? hinted Scrooge. Expect the second on the next night at the same hour, the third upon the next night when the last stroke of twelve has ceased to vibrate. Look to see me no more. 
when it had said these words, the apparition walked backwards from him, and at every step it took, the window raised itself a little, so that when the spectre reached it, it was wide open, and he floated out upon the bleak, dark night. Scrooge closed the window and examined the door by which the ghost had entered. It was double locked, as he had locked it with his own hands, and the bolts were undisturbed. He tried to say, HUMP! but stopped at the first syllable, and being much in need of repose, went straight to bed without undressing, and fell asleep upon the instant. That was part one of A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. Adapted and performed by Gary Andrews, with original music by Joy Tinniswood. A Christmas Carol is an Ego Trip Media presentation of an Archway Theatre Company production.